Welcome back, everyone. Do you ever wish you could read minds? I don't, most of the time. But I am legitimately curious about what goes through a Muslim's mind when they finally get around to comparing what they've been taught about Muhammad to what their sources say. What's it like when you realize that the man who has been exalted to a status of near divinity and perfection actually is portrayed quite, shall we say, imperfectly? One word comes to my mind, and it's in a recent comment talking about Muslims' response to Muhammad's violence specifically, and that is embarrassment. Are Muslims embarrassed at the way their own sources describe Muhammad's violence? And are Muslims embarrassed by how their own sources portray Muhammad's morality? While some may consider it very bold to suggest that Muslims are actually embarrassed by much of what their sources say about Muhammad, I sincerely believe they are. I believe embarrassment is one of the most common reactions in the Muslim world to non-Muslims reading their texts increasingly in recent decades and simply pointing out what they say. So I'm going to list some of the facts about Muhammad according to Muslim sources that I think Muslims are most embarrassed by, as well as how they frequently react to this embarrassment. I've covered all these issues in other videos, some of them multiple times in some detail, so I won't do that again here. The most embarrassing fact about Muhammad, I believe, is the satanic versus incident. On a scale of 1 to 10, I give it an embarrassment factor of 1,000 because it is, as far as I know, universally denied. For almost all of the first two centuries of Islam, nearly all scholars writing biographical details and commentaries talked about Muhammad reciting satanic verses, and nearly all early Muslims believed it. It's hard to think of any other belief about Muhammad that has been so thoroughly overturned. Modern Muslims are committed to rejecting the satanic verses. It doesn't matter how many sources you show them. I have 50 in a video on my channel. It doesn't matter what early Muslims believed. No matter what, Muslims will always find a way, motivated by sheer embarrassment, to reach the conclusion that the satanic verses never happened. The embarrassment surrounding this issue is as universal as the rejection of it. The second most embarrassing issue is that, how should I put this, Muhammad had intercourse with a little girl. I get this a 9 on a scale of 1 to 10 because it's not universally denied, like these satanic verses. Some do deny it in spite of how well it's attested in Muslim sources, but to be clear, Muslims attempting to defend their religion have no issues denying any of their sources whenever it suits them. The denial of their own sources at will is one of the most consistent themes in Dawah. So while Muhammad's sexual relationship with a prepubescent girl isn't universally denied, embarrassment is still apparent in a few ways. And if of course, those who do deny this do so on absolutely no grounds, and it shows what happens when you're dealing with serious cognitive dissonance. Also, child marriage is in Islamic law based on Muhammad's example and permitted in the Quran, so denial, for many reasons, is simply not a viable option. Others will come up with bizarre theories about accelerated puberty in the 7th century deserts of Arabia, even though the Hadith clearly describe Aisha as an immature girl. Still others will appeal to eccentric legends about biblical figures in an attempt, apparently, to make them look as bad as Muhammad. Look, they married young girls too. The absurdity of such attempts shows what happens when the defenses of Muhammad are motivated by sheer embarrassment. Next, adult breastfeeding. I give this an 8 on a scale of 1 to 10 just because it's not as frequently discussed as Muhammad sleeping with a 9-year-old. Before modern medicine, some physicians believed that effectively blood and milk were the same substance but they were simply transformed, say when a woman was pregnant or after giving birth. This led to some bizarre theories about kinship. If a woman's breastfeeding and breast milk is transformed blood, would that make someone a blood relative? There are even examples of adult breastfeeding in antiquity. Arabs were greatly informed, or should I say misinformed, by Greek medicine. So breastfeeding to establish kinship and adult breastfeeding are all well attested in the Hadith. Adult breastfeeding is particularly embarrassing, of course, but even if we set that aside, the brilliant scientist Muhammad still espoused theories about the human body that we know to be completely wrong. This is one example of Muhammad simply being a man of his time, repeating information current in his day. This brings us to our next topic, Muhammad's knowledge of science more broadly. I give this an embarrassment factor of 5, increasing toward 8. What I mean by that is that the scientific miracles of Islam is a fairly recent argument, as Islamic countries lagged behind the modern world. Muslim apologists tried to smooth that over by showing how scientifically informed the Islamic sources are. However, like all good Islamic apologetic narratives, like the miraculously preserved Quran, the scientific miracles narrative crashed and burned. Some popular Muslim apologists even openly admitted it. For me, a narrative that's so astonishingly popular that crashes and burns so quickly constitutes an embarrassment factor of eight because I think it will persist in some echo chambers. Many Muslims, due to its popularity, still believe this theory. 
A lie spreads more quickly than the truth. I've spoken to Muslims recently who still believe in the scientific miracles. The more Muslims actually read what Muhammad said about, for example, what makes a child resemble its parents or a host of other things, embarrassment is unavoidable and the embarrassment factor will increase. But for now, I think we're stuck in the 5 to 8 range. For our remaining examples of how Muslims are embarrassed by their prophet, we enter the category with increasing currency in the West. Muhammad is a victim. This is also important to pay attention to for those of us who are interested in observing how Western Islam is continuously adapting to its ever-changing revolutionary socio-political environment. So first, poor Muhammad, the victim, was bewitched with a hairbrush by a Jew. After a complex calculation involving the variables of embarrassment, victimhood, and anti-Semitism, I came up with a factor of six. I've done several videos about how magical properties have been associated with things like hair and dust. Obviously, we see these things in Islamic sources. In this case, a Jew got some of Muhammad's hair and gained power over him. Some deny Muhammad was bewitched, but even on popular Muslim websites, it's openly admitted. So it's not embarrassing enough to deny outright. But, you know, it's pretty embarrassing. Christians in the audience can't imagine the embarrassment of Jesus getting up, ready to give the Sermon on the Mount until, you know, a Pharisee approaches with a hairbrush. It's so hilariously stupid. Additionally, the accounts of the evil hairbrush-wielding Jew fuels a stigma which perpetuates Islamic anti-Semitism, as if that fire needed any more fuel. This helps to counteract the embarrassment and see Muhammad as a victim of the Jews. That is, we are told the reason for much of Muhammad's violence, which gets an embarrassment factor of 7, decreasing toward 0. A 7 is warranted because there are accounts of Muhammad having women killed, mass beheadings, execution of people who simply criticized him, torture, and so forth. Also, Muhammad carried out dozens of campaigns. Warlord isn't appropriate for anyone if it's not appropriate for him. In other words, there are levels of violence that many Muslims believe are too much and shouldn't be attributed to their prophet. But he's also occasionally portrayed as cowardly. At Kaibar, for example, he ambushed people who were explicitly said to be unarmed. However, embarrassment decreases toward zero, turning into pride. This is because Muhammad's violence is characterized as a reaction to oppression, in large part from the Jews. Muhammad used violence because he had no other option, you see. The parallels between this and the Palestinian narrative, or the victimhood narrative more broadly in the West, is clear as it is so demonstrably flawed. But the more violence is seen as appropriate by Western revolutionaries, the more proudly Muslim leaders in the West will embrace their status as victims and openly speak about Muhammad's violence and use that as an example to follow. Of course, they're already doing that fairly frequently in Islamic hellholes like Dearborn. But how can you be any more victimized than to be killed? It's hard to know where to put this, so I went with a five. Circumstances surrounding Muhammad's death are unclear, even in the Islamic sources. But one influential account reads like satire. Imam Isi couldn't do any better. Muhammad murdered a bunch of Jews, including some of the family of a woman. She then invited Muhammad to dinner. Sounds suspicious. He accepted. In a shocking turn of events, the meat was poisoned. Poor Muhammad victimized by the Jews again. But when taking into account how women are generally portrayed as lacking sense in the Islamic sources, this is even worse. Muhammad was fooled by a Jew woman, and he later died from the poison. This is really embarrassing, but I give it a five because people love things that fuel their conspiracy theories, and nobody is better or worse at spreading conspiracy theories about Jews than Muslims. Additionally, Islamic anti-Semitism ultimately serves as justification for numerous Islamic sources that speak about mass violence against Jews during the last days. They had it coming, you see. Speaking of which, just the other day, I was listening to an imam talking again about the old organ harvesting conspiracy. Nothing is below these people. There is truly nothing too stupid to say about the Jews. But hey, they killed Muhammad, who was dumb enough to trust a chef whose family he had murdered. Embarrassment abounds, but such accounts, like the bewitching, also serve the agenda of hate, which offsets the embarrassment because of the utility. So yeah, it's another stupid embarrassing story about Muhammad, but it also serves an ideological purpose against a group of people. So are Muslims embarrassed by their prophet? I really think they are. You've just seen a few reasons why. Let me know what you think in the comments section. I'm sure we could probably do another few videos like this based on your experiences as well. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.